So I also, uh, like uh, Paul, wanted to start by again thanking uh, AXA and uh, AXA Research for its uh, uh, great generosity funding my funding my research. Uh, of course, I work in a fairly, uh, you know, related but fairly different uh, research space. I, I lead the Decentra Decentralized and Distributed Systems Lab at EPFL in Lausanne. Um, and uh, uh, and I'll, I'll get to what my lab does in just a minute. But first, since this is supposed to be about blockchain I I IoT, um, I want to first by talking, start by talking about IoT. You know, what is Internet of Things? I assume you, know, you all are well aware. The way I see it is both a huge opportunity uh, in functionality, convenience, stemming from the types of data that uh, IoT devices can provide and the kind of functionality they can provide, but also it presents huge risks in terms of security and privacy. Um, I think the first one is obvious, so I'm not going to dwell on that. I want to talk about the second one for a few a few minutes. So who who remembers this incident a couple uh, a year or so ago when basically the IoT, namely just one part of the IoT, na namely a bunch of webcams, basically took down the internet for uh, uh, for a little while, um, le uh, level three, I believe. Um, and, uh, and uh, IoT devices, at least in the current uh, state of the art, tend to be a security disaster uh, because, uh, because the software they're built with and, and the configurations are often, uh, you know, kind of very bottom of the bottom of the barrel security, very kind of uh, uh, weak attention to the security, uh, you know, and many of them have been found to have uh, a default username password. So all you have to do is search around the internet, try the manufacturer default usernames and passwords, and you find thousands of devices you can break into. Um, and that's one of the lists, by the way, so you can actually use that list and go break into a bunch of devices if you care to. Um, and so, so coming to my lab, you know, what's the problem that I'm trying to, uh, uh, trying to address? Uh, the problem, uh, one of the big problems I see it is, is uh, the current information security systems are built uh, with kind of patchwork uh, um, uh, uh, security solutions where, you know, we identify a flaw, we try to fix it, we identify this other flaw, we try to patch it. Um, and this create, fundamentally creates what I call weakest link systems, where, where uh, somebody has to find any, any little uh, uh, chink in the armor and they're, kind of, they're, they're in and home free. And this only gets worse as, as devices and connectivity proliferate, uh, uh, for example, as the you know, number and variety of devices uh, on the internet explode. And of course, also as uh, connectivity between uh, companies and networks and users, more data sharing uh, increases. Uh, in this weakest link security model, it often just takes one break-in in one network in one company or one user, uh, and an attacker you know, can find their way through several networks and find the big juicy database uh, that, that gets stolen. And this has happened uh, you know, many times, uh, several years ago now. Um, Paul, do you have a security clearance? I'm curious. I used to. Before pre OPF, oh, yeah, no, okay. No, so, so they, so, so they know everything about you. Yeah, so, yeah, congratulations. So, uh, <laughs> um, so you know, a few years ago, uh, uh, hackers got in not directly to the OPM, but through another network, uh, for a, a partner company. Uh, kind of came in through the side and got, got this hugely valuable personal information database about everybody who had security clearances in the US. Uh, much more recently and fairly regularly, we're seeing hospitals uh, get hit with ransomware attacks and things like that. And, and a lot of these are, have to do with uh, security critical medical devices that, uh, that have network functionality. Um, and so this is becoming a really critical problem. And of course, you know, I, I can't not bring up the, the recent Equifax example where you know, almost half of the US population basically had their data stolen from one big, data, one big poorly secured database, right? So this is a huge problem. Uh, I want to now talk about what my lab is trying to do about it toward, toward, uh, uh, toward uh, finding better solutions. So the basic, uh, so the name of my lab is based on decentralized and distributed systems, uh, uh, DDIS. Um, and what I mean by that is, of course, you know, distributed systems are, you know, systems that are spread all over, all over the world, all over a network. But what I mean by decentralized is 
uh, is a system in which we have multiple independent participants uh, in which none of them is completely trusted with respect to the other. Um, uh, some might be more trusted than others, uh, so they, they might have dis different relationships, but my goal is to ensure that no, no future system we build has a single point of failure or compromise. An attacker should not be able to take down or compromise the privacy of the system as a whole by compromise any single either server or company or, or uh, you know, participant in the system. And you know, we want to turn this security game around uh, from this you know, traditional weakest link security uh, model to what I call its strongest link security model, where not only does it take multiple compromises in order to break the system as a whole, we want to, we want to get to a point where making the system bigger instead of you know, decreasing, causing the security to decrease as it, as it is typical in current systems, we want to redesign, rethink systems so that security increases as they get bigger. And we can do that, but it's really hard because current systems are not designed that way, right? Um, and to, to illustrate uh, uh, on, an, on another dimension, um, uh, to illustrate the challenges, I want to point out that when we talk about security, especially in the computer science world, we're talking about not just one type of uh, property. We want, typically want at least three properties from the systems we built. First of all, integrity. We want to make sure that the system actually stores the data correctly, computes answers correctly, and is generally is honest, basically. We want availability. We want it to be there when we need it, give an answer when we need it in a reasonable time. And we want privacy. We want it not to share um, especially personal information uh, when it's not supposed to. Uh, and and I, a lot of the, the real technical challenge is, is getting these three things together. Um, and and one, of, you know, one of the basic principles <clears throat> of my lab and my work is that I, I, uh, I don't believe we can, we can ever achieve real security unless we uh, think about all three of those things and, and build all three properties into the system kind of from the, from the ground up uh, as we're building new systems. So, um, so that's kind of the, the basic principle. I haven't talked about blockchain yet. So what, what about blockchain? Now, I actually do a lot of blockchain work, but uh, the, the first thing to mention is that the uh, blockchains are not new, but the, the principles, the security and privacy principles are absolutely old news, sorry, in computer science. Um, uh, in that kind of the, the basic mechanisms for spreading trust across multiple part, multiple independent parties, uh, such that you know any one or any uh, a few can be compromised without compromising the system as a whole. That's those have been around for decades in various uh, techniques such as threshold crypt cryptography and Byzantine consensus. Uh, you know, I'm not going to get into the details, but basically they ensure that you know we can build systems that that tolerate multiple points of compromise. Um, but these were never really widely deployed. So, so you know, computer science, scientists knew for decades that we could build these systems, but we couldn't convince anybody that they're actually useful, practical, and worthwhile until this big event, which, uh, you know, Bitcoin, Bitcoin coming around and basically showing, hey, you can do this, it can actually scale, and it's useful for something. It actually has an economic reason to exist, and that was the awesome thing. It kind of spread the news beyond computer science, and of course we've seen how that's taken hold uh, in, uh, you know, now that everybody wants a blockchain, you know, in, in some way or another, some, sometimes for good reasons, sometimes for not so good reasons, but I think, you know, uh, despite some of the overhype and noise and confusion surrounding it, I think it's a hugely positive thing because it's gotten the news to the, re you know, to the broader mainstream world that it's both possible and really a good thing to try to build systems that distribute trust in this way, right? Um, so I'm not going to you know, go uh, into any detail about how blockchains work. Basically, they're a, an abstraction of a ledger. Um, uh, and you know, ledgers have been around a long time in banks and stuff. But basically, the idea is, uh, is we, don't, we no longer want to trust any single party, a bank or whatever, to hold the ledger. Instead, we, uh, we spread it around. We, we uh, allow multiple independent participants, whether they be individuals or, or companies, to hold copies and check each other's work. 
Uh, and as we as as we've seen, um, you know, this kind of uh, this concept started being popularized by Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, but the but it's not at all specific to cryptocurrencies. And we've seen lots of very interesting applications to in in many different ways, and uh, and especially most recently the the wonderful application to insurance that Laurent uh, just uh, just presented. So. And so the generality is fantastic. Now coming back to IoT, uh, what does blockchain have to do with IoT? So here's another area I, I see tremendous promise. Uh, um, uh, uh, so in, in several ways, um, it's not there yet, but, uh, uh, but one of the big problems I mentioned with IoT is managing and securing I IoT devices, starting with even just knowing what devices are on your network and what software versions they have and have they been updated or not. Um, I think blockchain-based network management and cybersecurity management could help a lot th uh, there if, if implemented and deployed properly. Uh, and then the next obvious thing is all of these IoT devices are producing, going to be producing tremendous amount of very useful but often privacy sensitive data as, as, uh, as the previous talks uh, 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 um, uh, um, mentioned, but, uh, but the actual protection and securing of that data, both its integrity, its availability, and its privacy, uh, all three of those properties are tremendously important and, and very difficult challenges, which I think the right kinds of blockchain technology could, uh, could help with. And, and you know, just generally making the data and, and systems more accountable in general. Uh, but so there's a tremendous amount of promise there, but I want to you know, point out that today's blockchains are not prepared to fulfill that promise. And I'll come, ba come back to that. So, of course, we've seen tremendous investment in, in blockchain technology, uh, so this is, this is great, um, but there's a bunch of problems we have to fix. So, uh, you know, to summarize br briefly, current, especially public blockchains are actually very slow. Uh, 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 they, um, they have you know, weak consistency, very few uh, uh, limited total throughput. This is, this is a worse problem for some applications than for others. Um, they have serious pri privacy problems. Uh, a third problem that not, not many people are talking, talking about uh, so far is you kind of have to be online in order to know what's on the blockchain or to check uh, what's on the blockchain. This can be a problem for, for many applications and, and uh, there's a lot of efficiency issues. Um, but without getting into the details, I wanna especially point out one of the important uh, 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 one of the important tensions, which is the way, fundamentally, the way a blockchain, uh, blockchains are uh, designed to, to ensure integrity of transactions or of, say, smart contracts being e executed, how do they ensure that integrity? Well, they spread the information around. Uh, so, you know, anything that's on the blockchain basically is secured, uh, its integrity is secured by spreading it around, making many copies of it, but this kind of naturally works against privacy uh, in that, uh, you know, so, so as Laurent alluded to, you have to be very careful what, uh, exact, what information you put on the blockchain because, it, because anything that's actually on it and useful for a smart contract to process on, for example, is going to be, you know, has to be public, right? Um, and so, uh, 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 and so uh, the, the integrity protection that current blockchains provide kind of work against the privacy protections we, we would like to have, right? Um, and then, uh, and you know, of course, uh, like I mentioned, there's, there's many other issues with, with efficiency and throughput and stuff. Um, finally, one of the, one of the other uh, uh, big risks I want to point out that you know blockchains is a very very hot new uh, immature market, and uh, as we've seen in in the cybersecurity market in general, um, there uh, a lot of people pointed out that the that these types of markets tend to be lemon markets. If you're you know familiar, uh, I assume many of you are familiar with the term where you know producers know a lot more about the quality, especially kind of the security quality of a product than consumers. It's very hard for consumers to judge, so they tend to prefer the first thing to market, which is often the worst in terms of quality and 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 security. And so I'm worried that we may you know, be seeing kind of a lemon market for blockchains uh, um, 
uh, emerging in which a lot of uh, a lot of really you know old, pretty insecure technology is is being dressed up in blockchain terminology uh, that actually doesn't actually provide any better security than than uh, than uh, traditional uh, weakest link systems. So. Um, uh, so with that, I just want to briefly uh, talk about some of the, some of the uh, activities in my lab that we're uh, doing to try to address some of these problems. So um, my lab, I think, is the only la academic lab uh, anywhere in the world that, I, that I'm aware of that's, uh, that's putting, putting a trem tremendous amount of effort into building a, f a new next generation blockchain infrastructure. We're building new blockchain software from scratch. And it's 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 working. Uh, you know, it's not uh, fully deployed yet. Uh, you know, it, it's it's still still under development. But uh, we're we're trying to we're working on making it first of all fast, highly scalable to high th transaction throughput. Uh, we're putting a lot of focus into into privacy de by design, so it knows how to keep data private natively. Uh, of course, highly available and powerful in, in terms of functionality. Uh, so just. Uh, touching on the first point, how, how fast can we build blockchains? So, uh, so uh, uh, we demonstrated last year a, an experimental system called BizCoin uh, that, uh, that kind of modifies the Bitcoin architecture. I won't get into the details, but, but uh, so that it's uh, in principle com uh, backward compatible with the type of proof of work and the type of uh, you know, open public architecture that Bitcoin uh, and Ethereum have. But, uh, but we can get uh, two orders of magnitude higher throughput, transaction throughput, and much faster commit times, commits, uh, transaction commits in seconds rather than minutes or, uh, or an hour or so. Um, continuing with that, uh, this last year we've, uh, we've shown how to, uh, uh, how to create kind of cloud-style scale-out blockchains, uh, where we take a large number of participants and securely divide them into, into subgroups that can process uh, each, uh, such that each group only has to pay attention and process to some, uh, some subset of the transactions. So we get bigger transaction capacity as the system grows rather than just the same constant capacity in the, as in uh, current blockchains with uh, like Ethereum or Bitcoin in which every participant has to process every transaction, right? Um, now, uh, the pri I want to kind of briefly touch on this privacy problem. So, uh, as I alluded to before, the current blockchains, uh, you, can, you, can, you can put encrypted data, you, you, can, uh, you have various ways to deal with, uh, with privacy. You can, first of all, just not put private uh, data on the blockchain at all. That's probably the ideal if you can get away with it. But, uh, but then a smart contract or anything can't compute on and, you know, the data that's not on the blockchain, right? Uh, you can encrypt data and then put the encrypted, put the ciphertext on the blockchain. But with current blockchains, the keys to that encryption, to the, kind of the, the keys to whatever happens, still stay off the blockchain and are subject to this classic weakest link security model where you're, you're dependent on whoever the, the key holder is to, to be secure. So you're not, the, uh, the privacy is not benefit, the integrity is benefiting from the blockchain, but the privacy is not. Um, and, uh, and actually, I, I wanna thank Laurent for, uh, for pointing out that, you know, kind of in the current system, you keep your, your uh, you know, kind of the user's account, uh, you know, personal information off the blockchain because you have to, and, you know, it should be secure, uh, but uh, that was, you know, God, that was, that was great in that, uh, you know, yeah, it should be secure, but uh, it's not getting the, the, the protection of the blockchain, the decentralized protection of the blockchain for that security, right? So, um, that's a problem we are trying to solve um, uh, with, a, with a feature we're calling Chain Managed Secrets, where we, you can actually encrypt data uh, care of the blockchain itself so that the blockchain logic can, uh, can effectively manage the policies and determine uh, when and under what uh, circumstances encrypted data can be used and uh, securely leave a trail of crumbs, an accountable trail of crumbs, if and when that data is ever used in, uh, in any fashion. So. Again, I won't get into detail, uh, but uh, and one uh, uh, one um, uh, one more uh, feature in the uh, uh, in this uh, next generation blockchain architecture that we've uh, uh, been building addresses the the online offline problem. So a lot of people are talking about securing documents such as 
um, you know, such as degrees, awards, uh, land titles, you know, kind of using blockchain to timestamp and notarize documents. That's a great idea, and, and it has a lot of uses, but it kind of uh, neglects the verification problem. The, a lot of people don't realize that you have to be online in order to securely verify that something is on a current blockchain. Um, and you know, if we're talking about a document that might be carried uh, you know, with someone uh, to, to a verifier who doesn't actually have internet access at a time, or you arrive in an airport and you're trying to get through the border and you can't, you know, they, uh, how many of you have, uh, have had to, you know, wait for hours in an airport because the, uh, the passport processing systems have been shut down. That's, that's an example of uh, a problem caused by the lack of being able to do offline verification of, uh, of documents. And so, again, without getting into details, uh, some of our recent work has addressed this by creating a uh, blockchain, uh, blockchain structure that can be, that's fully offline verifiable in a crypt cryptographic fashion and, and in such a way that uh, any party can, it, you can essentially time travel on the blockchain, any participant can prove to any other participant that here this thing, this transaction of interest, this document or whatever, maybe an insurance policy is on the blockchain, right? So, uh, uh, another application of this that, that we actually went into detail in, in the paper I mentioned in the, the last Usenix security is to secure software updates. So, and, and I think this is a, you know, particularly relevant to IoT, ensuring that, uh, that all of these IoT devices can get <laughs> software updates efficiently and quickly, and you can be sure that they're getting the correct software updates and not, uh, not some, some for forgeries. Um, so just finally, briefly, I know I'm uh, uh, kind of out of time, uh, uh, going back to the, transparent, uh, to the privacy issue, besides just storing uh, secrets or uh, private information on, the block, uh, 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 on blockchains in more powerful ways, uh, we're actually uh, using, uh, using modern uh, cryptography techniques uh, to uh, provide ways of processing uh, data in a privacy-preserving way. Uh, this is a project with, um, uh, uh, with a co my colleague Jean-Pierre Hubot, who runs a, uh, the LCA1 lab at, um, at EPFL. Together we built a system for privacy preserving queries of, uh, uh, of different types of records, in this case focused on med medical records, uh, health records, but it's not, uh, not at all specific to that. Um, and so, uh, uh, and, uh, and, you know, so, and so this, uh, this approach has a, uh, has a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, protections, including anonymization and uh, techniques such as anonymization and differential privacy built in. Of course, you know, there's no perfect solution to, to data protection, you know, as, as Paul very uh, aptly pointed out, but, uh, but there's a lot we can do to make the system, uh, make, make protections better than they are, and so we're trying to build that into this uh, next generation blockchain infrastructure. So, um, that's about it. In, in, su in summary, I think blockchain technology does hold great pro uh, promise, uh, including for IoT applications, uh, but the current blockchains that are out there don't have the tools and features we need. They can, th those tools can be built, and, and you know, uh, we're working on building them. Other, uh, others are too, but um, you know, kind of we're, we're gradually getting these, uh, getting these uh, uh, production ready and deployed, and I would be very happy to work with potential partners in figuring out, you know, what other uh, what other use cases we can put these to. So uh, thanks a lot, and uh, happy to. Thank you. Mm -hmm.